Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Buckeye Weekly Podcast. I am Tony Gerdeman, here as always with Tom Orr. Tom, how's it going? Well, Tony, we had not talked to any Ohio State players in, what, two and a half weeks? Something like that? It was like, uh, it'd be great to talk to some Ohio State players. And, uh, well, Tony, Ohio State's SIDs made, made our dreams come true. We got to do, like, talk to 20 Ohio State players. It was like a quarter of the roster. And uh, this was, you know, this was, I said to you afterwards, this was like the parent who's like, oh, yeah? Yeah, you you, you want to smoke? All right, let's see, let's see you smoke the pack, smoke the whole pack, and uh, you, you oh yeah, you you guys want to do interviews? All right, that's fine. Why don't you interview like literally the whole team? And then we did, and then we did, and it was it was two good hours of talking to a bunch of guys that we haven't, as you said, hadn't gotten to talk to, and you know, would it have been great to get somebody last week? Maybe, but I mean, we've got so many guys now that we don't we don't need to see them again until after the game, as far as I'm concerned. I don't want to see another player. Um, but no, it was good to talk to a bunch of guys today and really, uh, it might not surprise people to find out that Michigan was a topic of conversation, also Georgia, and we'll get into that. But the, the big news that came as we were there at interviews was the commitment of Lincoln Keenholtz out of Pierre, South Dakota at, uh, from TF Riggs high school. Tom, do you know what TF stands for? Uh, I have answers that would probably get us uh you know so we can't monetize this video on youtube but i don't uh i don't know thomas franklin i believe it is theodore funkadelic um mm. so he mm. yeah of the parliament funkadelics i believe so i believe that one in the same uh, as i said out of pierre south dakota the number one player in south dakota the number 13 quarterback in a nation overall number 14 actually according to the 24 7 composite the number 204 player overall in the 2023 class, previously committed to Washington, decommitted maybe today, and then also, I'm not sure exactly when he decommitted, but obviously committed on Wednesday. Tom, do you know, and I'm sure you do, there is precedence here for a Washington quarterback commit to eventually commit to Ohio State and from your beaming smile I realize I know you just realized who that is Tom who is that well Tony uh, the hint that I will give the listeners is that this one is different because uh, this quarterback can uh, get you know get things off of the counter without having to uh, get the step ladder uh, but yes the the uh, late great still alive Tathan Martell <laughs> was a Washington quarterback commit and then a where else was he Texas A&M? Texas A&M, right? Yeah, Texas A&M, yes. Um, and then Ohio State, and then Miami, and then UNLV. Uh, and so, yes, he is, uh, Lincoln Keenholz, a little less well-traveled than Tate Martell, but uh, is someone who, if you want to hear some, you know, a little bit more in-depth uh, breakdown on this, I recorded a, an emergency episode of the Skull Session podcast with Mark Givler, since Mark Givler was at the at the interviews with us today. Uh, so I talked to him about that and kind of got got his thoughts on it. And you know, Keen Holtz is someone who is, I think, I think everyone with Ohio State quarterbacks at this point just sort of assumes, yeah, 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 yeah. He's got a really strong arm and he's got a really good, accurate touch. Yeah, 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 yada, yada, yada. Okay, tell me, does he run? Will he run the ball? That's will he run the ball? That's the question. That that is the question. And the answer is yes. He is, you know, probably. You know, not not a run first quarterback, but a willing runner and uh, someone who has run the ball quite a bit in uh, in his offense in high school. And then, of course, the next question is, um, so South Dakota. So this is like the same level of uh, competition you're playing in, like South Florida, right? And the answer is yes, yes, it is. Um, and then, just in case you don't believe that, uh, you know, the the uh, yes, there there is. You know, I, I think it's reasonable for people to wonder about the level of competition you're playing in South Dakota, even in the big, you know, big school division of South Dakota. The schools are not that big and there's not that many people. But, you know, he's someone who has, uh, you know, been been validated by a number of other programs. And Washington's uh, coaching staff has done a pretty darn good job establishing a pretty good passing attack. So that's uh, that's some pretty good validation as well. If if the Washington coaching staff is saying, you know, thumbs up on that. Yeah. And. Further uh, comparisons to Tate Martell, the, the running ability. Uh, Keenholz obviously is what, like, listed at like 6'3, yeah, 6'3, 185. 
I believe rushed for about 1,400 yards this year, like 1,100 yards last year. As I said, he is the number 14 quarterback overall. When Tate Martell committed to Washington, he was a 14-year-old quarterback overall. Uh, so again, some similarities there as well. You mentioned the, si- the, the the small school aspect, whatever. He does live in the capital of South Dakota. So show some respect, please. And just to you know, sort of play out the, uh, you know, the the similarities between him and Tate Martell, uh, Lincoln's secretary is named Tate, and Tate's secretary is named Lincoln. Not many people know that, but hmm, interesting. Um, I'm going to take back my part about the big city. Do you know the total population there in Pierre? You know, you started saying that, and I thought I should look that up, and then I didn't look that up on my phone. Uh, I'm going to guess the population of Pierre, South Dakota, is. 38,000 people. 14,000 people, Tom. That seems low. Wow. So, life in the big city. <laughs> but, um, again, I think the, the running aspect, and we're kind of joking about it, but it is going to be, I think, something that Ohio State fans are certainly wanting to see. We saw that with Devin Brown as well, the 2022 signee, freshman, true freshman quarterback. I don't really remember seeing that much with Kyle McCord, although he's not in- incapable. But it is interesting how they've kind of gone and found somebody because I don't I don't know that Brock Glenn, who was formerly previously committed to Ohio State, decommitted a, a few weeks back because of this. Ohio State and Brock Glenn kind of mutually parted ways, knowing that expecting that this would happen. And I don't know that Glenn is the runner that Lincoln Keenholz is. I, I I don't think he is. And so you get this another uh, this aspect of the offense going again, and I think for a lot of people, maybe me and you included, this has kind of been the one aspect of the offense that has been missing. Because you go back to Justin Fields' time, obviously they had that; they haven't had it in the last couple of years. They didn't have it in 2018, and you see how um, how much they've fallen short of perhaps their potential. It does feel like an element that has, you know, in the years where they have not had the running quarterback, that has coincided in a lot of cases with years where the running game has not necessarily been as consistent. And, you know, there are plenty of other factors that go into that and the offensive line and, you know, hey, are literally all of the running backs hurt? Like, you know, that that also goes into, you know, your success running the ball. But it does feel like there is there is some correlation there. And even if you are a running quarterback, a dual threat quarterback, you look at like a J.J. McCarthy or, you know, a Stetson Bennett, you don't have to be able to run 18 times a game like J.T. Barrett did. You just have to be able to avoid the rush, present the, you know, the the threat of the run, and that that's often enough to accomplish what running the ball actually does. You know, J.J. McCarthy, I think... We we talked about this on our one of our bold prediction shows. I don't think he's run the ball more than six times in a game or more than seven times in a game all season. But the fact that he's got that ability, the defense has to respect it, and you end up getting the same result. Ohio State now stands at 20 commits for the 2023 class. That is the number four class nationally, according to 24-7. Still waiting to get maybe one more defensive end. It looks like others are... Maybe two more defense fans. We'll see where Mateo Uyungalele, Uyungalele ends up, and they've got uh, other guys that that are um, they're waiting on as well. But they've got their quarterback. That's one that they needed. They want to bring in one every year, and so that now is done. Tom, anything else on the keynotes before we move to Travion Henderson? Let's move to Travion Henderson. Tom, let's move to Travion Henderson. Uh, came out on Tuesday and said that he's done for the season. Going to need surgery on his foot. <laughs> Ryan Day on, I don't know, I don't, I don't know days anymore, Tom, but I believe it was Tuesday or Monday, Sunday, whatever it was, said we'll figure it, we'll, we'll know more in a couple of days, which is pretty much the same verbiage he used for Jackson Smith and Jigba before Jackson Smith and Jigba was announced that he was out. And so once Day said that, I know – you and others were like, well, that means Trevion's out. I'm like, I don't know. I didn't really take it that way. You know, I, I think there's, you know, we'll find out in a couple of days. And then 
I don't know, a few hours later, Travion tweets that he's he's not going to play the rest of the season. And so they'll be without him. We did talk to Mayan Williams today. I don't know exactly what he said about how his health will be. I assume he said he'll be 100%. But not having Travion Henderson, I obviously you would like to have him. I don't. I don't know how much things change by not having him, though. Well, I think you have to have either Henderson or Mayan Williams. One or the other, you've got to have. And, yeah, I was also not at the Mayan Williams table, so I have no idea what Mayan Williams said, but I will, I'm will. i going to treat Mayan Williams the same way I treated Mike Hall, which was, oh, he's coming out for interviews. I guess he's playing, and there's not any question whether he's going to play because he's going to get asked whether he's going to play, and then he's going to have to you know answer I'm not sure, maybe Mike Hall is 100%, well, as close to 100% as you're going to be this time of year, essentially. I I am going to assume that Mayan Williams is in that same boat, because he did not, you know, Williams, with Williams, it was not like a long-term injury. It was, he got rolled up on with his ankle, and it looked like a high ankle sprain, and that's the kind of thing that tends to be somewhere in that three to five-ish weeks kind of range, and by the time the peach bowl rolls around, he should be close to a hundred percent. If that is, if that is all the things that, uh, you know, if, if all the reckless assumptions that I just made right there are all accurate, then yes, he should be uh, good to go for the peach bowl. The, uh, the reason I say, I don't think it changes much is because they've been without him for three of the last four games. And one game he did play, he was not effective. And that was what Maryland or I think Maryland. Then when they had to put Dallin Hayden in and he went for a hundred and, 50 odd yards in the second half. So not having him isn't anything new for them. They've basically been without him the last four games and they'll just continue on. Uh, We did get an answer though from Ryan day as to why Dallin Hayden didn't really play against Michigan when he was asked about that on Tuesday and day said, well, you know, it's kind of a flow of the game thing. And really that's, you know, that's Tony Alford's call. And then later on, he mentioned again that it was Tony Alford's call as to who plays when, and so there, the national, the uh, the the mystery, the national nightmare is over. We now know that Day said it had nothing to do with ball protection or anything like that. They just always, they always want ball protection, and it's not something that even though he always talks about that with Dallin Hayden, it's not not been an issue. But this was just a flow of the game thing, and I, to me, I guess Tom, that goes to the idea that. Ryan Day in this offense struggles at times to find a flow of the game. You know, like they they can never really get that rhythm that they're looking for. It it does feel like it's been a little bit of it just kind of disjointed a bunch this season. And I think part of that is a function of not having the same guys from you know drive to drive at times, uh, you know, let alone week to week and and uh, month to month. It's just they've kind of just constantly had somebody out, and that's a tough thing to try and account for. And try, you know, you it's hard to get in a rhythm when you're in, and then you're out for a week and a half, and then you're back in, and then you get hurt again, and you're back out. And it's just how many different running backs did they have that were the leading, you know, the the leader in terms of number of carries per game? I'm going to guess probably at least four. And that's only because the fifth guy, Evan Pryor, was hurt before the season and didn't get a chance to play. But that, you know, so so I think part of it is that. And, you know, I mean, we've talked a bunch about the, uh, you know, the play calling and, and my thought that trying to have Ryan Day trying to call plays and also do the game management has led to Ryan Day not being particularly, you know, not, not doing the very best work he possibly could be doing in terms of both play calling and uh, game management, you you end up just kind of doing both things at about a B level instead of being able to do one of the things at an A plus level and delegating the other one to someone else. So, yeah, I mean, it, it is. I, I think if they have Mayan Williams back, and then you also have Dallin Hayden, and you also have presumably Chip Trainum is in the mix there as well for playing time. That probably gives you a pretty clear one, two, three pecking order for Tony Alford, and. You know, you, you're you're not necessarily going to be pulling guys out in order to try to get someone else going. You you know, if it is Mayan Williams, it is probably Mayan Williams, and Mayan Williams, if he's healthy, is going to get 20, 25 carries potentially, and then you know you're you're giving yourself a better chance to get into a rhythm there. Yeah, no, that's a good point. 
Uh, one other thing I guess we should mention is the transfer of Jansen Dunn jumping into the transfer portal. He is now the the final safety from the 2021 class of Ohio State's three safeties to hit the portal. Andre Turrentine hit went in the spring. Jalen Johnson went a couple weeks ago. And now Jansen Dunn is in the portal. And I guess you can't be too surprised given his injury history. Plus, he was jumped by both Ohio State freshman safeties this year in, in Sonny Styles and Kai Stokes. You saw them those guys on the field. And Dunn has played in, oh, maybe six, I think, like six games and only only once on defense in his two-year career to this point. Yeah, it was two games in 2021, and he played on defense against Akron, and the other one was against in special teams. And then he played four games this year, and they were all on special teams. And if you're two years into your career, and the only time you got any snaps at all on defense was in September of the previous year, so, you know, you're talking like 20 games ago, something like that, 21 games ago, I mean, that that is one of those things where you don't have to read the tea leaves particularly closely there. Jalen Johnson is the same thing. Jalen Johnson had literally never taken a snap on defense. It's like, yeah, that those are the guys who are going to transfer after two years because they can read the writing on the wall just like you can. So, you know, I mean, it's it's also, I think, a little bit of function of, hey, the whole, you know, the defensive coaching staff changed between the time that those guys showed up and now the role of the safeties has kind of changed what they're looking what they're looking for in terms of safeties has kind of changed. So, you know, this this may be one of those, you know, it's like a no fault divorce thing. It's not, you know, it's not that you 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 just you didn't get what you, you know, what you signed up for essentially and both parties can maybe say like, yeah, yeah, listen, this this may not be the best fit for you anymore and that's that's okay. And who knows if one of these two safe or one of the say one of the freshman corners from this year Ryan Turner or Jair Brown, do they become a nickel? safety at some point and then of course the Buckeyes have three safeties committed for 2023 and, and are trying to get a fourth one in Caleb Downs for even more big bold neon lettering writing on the wall so that's that's the situation there and uh, they will lose more guys once I think I, th- I don't want to say they're done right now because there are guys who are going to transfer and whether they do it now or, or announce they're going to do it now or wait until after after the season there are still more to come, but obviously we're not going to throw names at you. you. You can do the math on your own, and you'll generally come up fairly accurate. Tom, today we talked to, like you said, everybody, Michigan being a popular topic of conversation. The refrain that I kept getting from guys is that it was just it was Ohio State's mistakes. It wasn't anything that Michigan did special. It wasn't anything that you know they weren't expecting. Just guys not doing, just missed assignments. And Tanner McAllister even said he was he himself was trying to make the big plays. And it's after the fact where you realize, I don't need to make the big plays in a big game. I just need to make the plays. I just need to do my assignment. And so I think that was, sounded like that was an issue for other players as well. They believe they have corrected those things. And I don't know that you can actually correct them without proving it on the field. I don't think you can, you can prepare for them, but you can't correct them until you are presented with that same situation and you don't make that same mistake. But um, you know, I, I can't fault a guy for wanting to make a big play, but this is, it, I guess it's a different issue than previously where other guys are trying to do everybody's job this year. You're trying to do like, like a, just a big play is a different problem um, but still a problem. It is still a problem. And they were, he said, Tanner McAllister said at one point, you know, you have to do your job and you don't be Superman. You just, you have to do your job. You're not, you're not going to save the world. And I, I think it was someone else later said the same, I mean, the same thing with the same phrasing. I think it was JT to him all the while, but you have to do your job. Don't be Superman. And that, that's one of those big game things where you want to be the hero. You want to be the guy who saves the day. You want to be, Chris Gamble against Penn State in 2002 or Will Allen against Michigan in 2002 or, you know, you want to be the guy who makes the big play and writes his name into the history of Ohio State football. And sometimes you got to just do your job. And sometimes you just got to like shove the dude out of bounds and move on, you know, move on to the next thing. Sometimes you got to just get, you know, don't try to jump the pass and have the guy get behind you and turn a 
long play into a much longer touchdown. There's just there's a bunch of that little stuff that just you you've got to kind of adjust to. One thing that was interesting to me was uh, it was Jordan Hancock who said they the day after the Michigan game, the Sunday after the Michigan game, they all went in, they watched the film, and they watched specifically the five big plays that Michigan had, and looked at them, learned from them, went out on the field, and then executed the plays. And you know, so it was it was a you know we hear Jim Knowles talk all the time about. You know, taking it taking it from the film room to the field. They quite literally took it from the film room to the field. That was the day after the game. Just, you know, no sugarcoating it, no anything. Just address the issues and then try and make sure you don't have those issues again when you play your next game. And I don't know who said it. And again, we ran through, I believe, 21 players. But... um, the and actually, I'm looking through all of this YouTube stuff now, Tom. And of course, as I do, I've lost my train of thought. So, well, I'll tell you what. While you're while you're gathering your train of thought, I will say that something else that happened in the days after the Michigan game was JT Tuimolowau. JT Tuimolowau said, you know, they it under, sort of understandably the mood was not great inside the Woody after the Michigan game. And, you know, he got up in front of the team and talked to them about the fact that, look, you know, you've got to, you have to keep, it was the same message the coaches were, were, uh, you know, sharing basically after the game, I think, which is the season is not over. You can still make the college football playoff. You just, you know, so you have to, you cannot go into vacation mode. You have to, you've got to keep working as if there is a college football playoff game coming in a month because there very well might be a college football play game coming in a month. And what was interesting to me was, he said, you think of JT Tui Molowai as one of the big stars on the team this year. He said, he approached some of the older guys and said, do you think it would be okay if I talked to the team? Like, if I spoke to the team. And, you know, he, he was talking to, like, the seniors. So, you know, I'm, I'm assuming, you know, Zach, Zach Harrison or Tyler Friday, who's a captain, or, you know, someone, you know, folks like that. And they said, yeah, yeah that's fine. And then he did. He got up and he talked to the team about, the fact that, you know, hey, the season is not over. Yeah, you didn't get the result you wanted against Michigan. You're not playing in the Big Ten Championship game, which you also obviously wanted. But the season's not over. You got to kind of stay with it. And, you know, that was something that you heard other guys talk about. That was, you know, by the time JT came out, we had heard that from other guys. So that was something that really did sort of resonate with other folks. And, you know, I mean, that that is a very difficult switch to flip to go from, you're playing Michigan. This is the game you've been waiting a year to play, and then you lose, and it, and you feel like your season's over. But then it's not. So that's that is a very difficult thing to, to you know, the emotional swings of that that seven days or so between that you know that the end of that Michigan game, and then the USC loss, and then the Kansas State loss, and then making it into the college football playoff anyway. That that was an emotional roller coaster that week. That. You know, JT Tui Molowau did his very best to kind of keep everyone on track there. And I, and I don't remember who it was, but somebody mentioned that even still, the practices weren't really as good as they could have been until they were they saw that they made the playoffs, and then that that ratcheted things up again. Because as Dewan Jones said, he like he thought that was his last game, and so people are asking, so you were not going to play in the Rose Bowl? Well, I don't know about that. I don't know if I was. But basically, a couple times he said that was his. He thought that was going to be his last game, and so uh, it's interesting that then JT Tui Molowa goes to the seniors like a Dewan Jones. Hey, do you mind if I talk to the team? Yeah, go ahead. I'm not playing again. You know, you know it's like I, I don't know how many seniors were going to opt out, but obviously there were going to be some juniors as well. And so, yeah, if you want to talk to the team, go ahead. That sort of thing. But I think also that's a good sign for next year because I think they need more of that. And what we've talked about before the show at lunch today, you look at who the captains are on this team, the defensive captains specifically, and if they don't play and they're not a, a vital portion of the on-field defense, what what kind of leadership are you getting there? So to have a guy like JT Tui Molowal already projecting that when he's going to be a junior, presumably his last year next year, and you'll have a vocal leader there, I think that will help. But you know, other guys were impacted by what JT said, and 
and that that helped them kind of snap out of it a little bit. And so, um, you know, it, it's just interesting that Ryan Day talks to him, and it's like, well, you know, we'll just kind of not that they're going through the motions. I do think probably some were. And so, you know, and Tom, if you're not, do you need? Does a player need to step up and talk? Like, if if ever if if there's no reason to talk, does a player have to talk? You know. Yeah, if there's not a reason to talk, there's no reason to talk. That's, you know, you don't, you, JT is not someone who talks to hear himself talk. He is, you know, I think by nature, not necessarily exactly that kind of guy, but he said he just really felt compelled to do it in that moment. And, you know, maybe this is, maybe this is something that helps set him up to do this more long term. This is something that Zach Harrison, I think, has talked about in the past about having confidence and that's even just during interviews. Zach Harrison is a much more compelling interview now than he was two, three years ago because he has a lot more confidence in himself. And he he has come out and said exactly that. He This is not me psychoanalyzing him. He's saying, no, I mean, I, I'm a lot more comfortable with myself and my role in the team and all of that. And that has come, you know, that has come out in terms of his personality coming out a little bit more during the interviews, but also coming out probably as a leader on the team this year. Maybe that is happening for JG Tuimolowo. Because you need you need captains who are both, you know, leaders in terms of guys who are playing on the field and are you know significant players in the team, and also guys who are, are willing to be the guy who stands up in front of the room and gives the fiery speech. And and you can have the lead by example guys, and that's fine. C.J. Stroud feels a lot like a lead by example kind of guy to me, where he puts in the work and he does things the right way and all that kind of stuff. But he's not he that's just not his personality from what we can kind of see. And other than him, that's not Tommy Eichenberg's personality, really. Tommy Eichenberg is not a big talker. And then you've got Tyler Friday, who's not playing a whole heck of a lot. And you've got Court Williams, who's been hurt all year. And you got Cam Brown or Cam Babb, who has been, you know, hurt for a decent chunk of the year and, and you know, had the had the really awesome, you know, an incredible play against against uh, Indiana. But, you know, outside of that, he's that's that's what he's done this year. And I think that's just that is a hard thing to try and have a team led by, you know, the one guy who's probably a little bit more inclined to be quiet and then a bunch of guys who are, um, you know, on the on the shelf or, or heard or or not playing a whole heck of a lot. And that's a I know I'm missing a captain on offense, but it wasn't someone who was, you know, it's not Marvin Harrison Jr. or something like that. But um, oh, it's Cade Stover. That's who it was. Cade Stover's the other captain. So and Cade Stover is not really a big talker either. He's sort of in the Tommy Eichenberg kind of camp. So it is it is something that where i think there could be a leadership uh, a leadership spot available for jt tuimolowo next year if he wants to be that kind of leader and be that kind of guy next year i i think that's a spot that might be good for him to try and assume well don't they say when your best players are your best leaders that's when you have your best teams and he would certainly uh, be in line for that speaking of injuries jackson smith and jigba obviously not playing his teammates were pretty defensive about him or, or coming to his defense on the day. I did not hear what C.J. Stroud had to say, but Emeka said, you know, I, nobody works harder. Nobody worked harder to get back than Jackson Smith and Jigba. And so, like, th- there's no thoughts from Ohio State's side that I could that we saw today that Jackson wasn't trying to do everything to get back or wouldn't be playing if, if he if he could play, he would definitely be playing. I don't know. Did you see anything? Were you there at all with CJ at all? I was not with CJ. I was there with with uh, Jordan Hancock, who's not necessarily the person you'd expect to be talking about it because he plays on the other side of the ball and was not in the same recruiting class as JSN. But he said JSN is, is maybe the most competitive person he's ever been around, and so it is just really killing him to be sitting out this game. But it's the right decision for him. So, I mean, it, that's just... That that's kind of where what this comes down to, and and it, it was yeah there was there was no one, not that anyone's going to come out and go that you no know, good for nothing son of a gun, how dare he not play? But you know there was there was no indication from anything anyone said on that subject that that is how anyone really feels right now. Yeah, another fun topic on the day. Not that that's a fun topic, but the. The Pac-12 championship game, and a lot of the a lot of the players were asked, "Hey, where were you when you? Where did you watch it? What was going on in your mind?" And I'm scrolling through here through these interviews, trying to remember who exactly said it. But one of their one of the guys said that um, once 
USC went up by like two scores towards the end there. Their dad called up, called him on the phone and was just yelling into the phone. Like no words, just yells. And uh, Steel Chambers said he, he and Tommy Eichenberg at their house and a bunch of other people were going crazy and talking to Tommy Eichenberg about this Utah connection that Ohio State has. They play him last year, ton of respect both ways. Like you have Tommy Eichenberg and Steel Chambers, like kind of huge fans of Cameron Rising in terms of the way he plays. He plays it the right way. And so I asked Tommy Eichenberg, like, are you a Utah fan? He's like, yeah, I'm a Utah fan. And it's hard not to be after playing them in such a hard fought game last year and then getting this huge favor uh, this time around. Uh, Dewan Jones said that he was at a high school basketball game and, you know, he was getting updates on his phone. So it was like 17 3 or 14 3 at one point, USC. And he's like, oh, it's over. You know, I'm not going to worry about it. And then I think, like, after the game, after the high school game, he looks and sees it's like 17 17 at the half. And he's like, starts to get excited about it. And, Makes it home in time to watch the fourth quarter. But, um, yeah, there's a lot, a lot of good stories about the, the experience of watching a very, very good Pac-12 championship game. Yeah, Mike Hall had, I think, the most unique answer, which was he was watching he was watching the game at home. But his, his big takeaway was he, he was excited to see his buddy B. Shaw making plays. Bryson Shaw, who was transferred out and is a safety at, at USC now, and had a couple big plays early in the game. He said he was really excited for him. Uh, Paris Johnson said his girlfriend was jumping up and down when USC lost, and for him, mentally, he's more like, on to TCU. And then when, when TCU lost, he knew, he said he knew they were good, but Paris Johnson was not quite ready to uh, punch punch their ticket to the college football playoff just yet on that Friday night. Um, I thought, Cade Stover, I don't think, I, don't, I wasn't there if Cade Stover was asked about that, but he uh, well he would have he would have been there with uh, Tommy and Steele so his uh, he was that that's where that were, that's probably where Cade Stover was that night. Um, Cade Stover I thought had an interesting uh, an interesting line. He said nobody writes a book without adversity in it, and you know that's what that's sort of how he's viewing the loss to Michigan right now. Is yeah, it didn't go the way they wanted it to, but they are still exactly where they would have been had they won that game, which is two wins away from the national championship, which is the ultimate goal, and you know, you're not, you, no one is going to have a complete smooth sailing uh, role to the national championship. You know, think back to Ohio State's previous national championship teams. They have all faced adversity at some point, you know, 2014, lost to Virginia Tech, barely made it in and, uh, you know, was down 21 to 6 to Alabama in the, uh, in the Sugar Bowl and was down 7 nothing to Oregon in the national championship game. 2002, that whole season was, they were undefeated, but that whole season, like nothing was easy that year. So. Uh, even 1968, O.J. Simpson takes a what 80-yard touchdown right down the field to start that game in the Rose Bowl uh, in the national championship. I mean that that's that's just how it is. You are going to have to come back. You're going to have to overcome, and that's that's sort of where they're where at least Cade Stover is looking at it right now. Cade Stover last year after the Rose Bowl said, uh, "If you never have a bad day, you don't know what a good day looks like." And so that's uh, kind of in line. I wonder, does he get these things from like the Farmer's Almanac? Is there <laughs> <laughs> Brother, old Richard's almanac is that where you just have some of these these farmer sayings that they have perhaps a one a day calendar uh what 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 whatever you might have there but um the uh yeah so obviously they enjoyed watching that Utah game and then everybody came into the facility on Sunday to watch the reveal they all felt pretty good about it but obviously that delay from 3 to 4 felt like a while as as they revealed three and we were doing the live show and it's like, what is taking so long? How can you, what, what uh, drama is being manufactured here? But uh, they all felt pretty confident, especially as you said, both teams losing. I think everybody believed they were in at that point. And of course they were the Bryson Shaw thing. Steel Chambers talked about that because they said it was, it was really odd. They were really torn because Bryson Shaw was single-handedly keeping them, them out of it, keeping Ohio state out of it, but that's their boy. And so they were they were exciting, uh, they were excited for him. But they, then they said he said they were also cussing him out. Basically, like every time you do something, it's you know blank blank you. And uh, eventually, obviously, Utah took over. But it's uh, a funny, interesting like bit of you're you're pulled in two directions there. And I guess you got you get to be happy for Bryson Shaw as a former teammate, but then also happy for yourself that Bryson Shaw only did so much in that game. But anything else, Tom? 
uh, I thought there were a couple guys who just had sort of interesting perspectives on things. Uh, one was uh, Paris Johnson, who was just named an All-American, first-team All-American. And he said he his goal coming in he was he wanted to be a captain or, or an All-American because he wanted to be able to come back to the Woody or whatever replaces the Woody at, at the time that Paris Johnson has grandkids and show his grandkids, you know, hey, look, Back in the day, I used to play ball here and have your picture on the wall with the other All-Americans or with the other captains or whatever it is. So, yeah, I thought that was, you know, th that was a uh, the type of perspective. You don't typically hear guys uh, in college, guys who are you know, 21 years old, talking about, you know, looking looking forward to be what they're going to be doing with their grandkids. I thought that was an interesting one. And Zach Harrison. Zach Harrison has sort of a unique perspective on everything with Ohio State, having grown up really local and being, you know, growing up essentially just outside of Columbus. And he said, you know, he, he remembers the 2014 national championship very clearly. And he said, what's interesting is those guys, when the 2014 guys come into the facility, they get treated like royalty because they, they did it. They reached the ultimate goal. And he said, you know, you see those national championship banners inside the Woody every single day. And he said, you know, the goal is to you now they have a chance to be one of those teams that puts a banner up there and then comes, you know, gets treated like royalty when they get when they come back to the Woody in the future. So, you know, that's uh, everyone has, you know, everyone has their own little uh, everyone has their own goals and their own ways of looking at things. I just thought that was, a you know, sort of an, an interesting, different kind of perspective on, you know, beyond just, hey, it would be cool to win a national championship sort of the why, the thinking, but you know, the why it's, you know, how that manifests in the life of a football player. Yeah, it was a good day all around uh, being there back at Ohio State and inside the WAC. Tom, I would like to end this show with some Big Ten uh, talk, some Michigan news and notes here. Did you see where Eric All just ended up? As you check your phone, don't look. I, I did not. I was... Uh... Look, I, a group text was blowing up, uh, and that was uh, nothing related to Eric All, unsurprisingly. Uh, I did not see where Eric All is ending up. I'm going to guess, because he's a tight end, I'm going to guess he ends up at Iowa. That is correct, with his old buddy, Cade McNamara, <laughs> uh, citing, uh, here's the quote from his tweet, uh, Boy, it is great to be a Hawkeye. Can't wait to be in Iowa City playing the game we all love. Excited to join the swarm at Iowa Swarm as well. You guys should join with me, iowaswarm.com. That is NIL, that is Iowa's NIL collective. Um, so good to see Iowa putting their NIL collective to some good use. A very talented player in Eric Hall. Uh, certainly room for more than one tight end there. They also have, of course, um, uh, Luke Lachey and uh, probably 16 others that were once former quarterbacks that outgrew the position or, you know, wh whatever they, they manufactured them one way or another. So good to see some big 10 money being spent. So, uh, Tom, anything else before we get out of here? Uh, no, I mean, there's plenty more, but we can, uh, I, I have a feeling this will not be the final podcast we do before the peach bowl. So there's probably time to talk about more of this stuff next time. Yeah. And of course, we, like, like we told you guys, we still have some listener questions episodes. We've got a couple of, uh, Georgia games yet to watch. We'll get to those as well. So I want to thank you all for joining us. As always, continue to find us at BuckeyeHuddle.com. Become a member. Say hello to us there on the message board. And also um, uh, YouTube.com slash Buckeye Huddle. Also, if you'd like to subscribe to Buckeye Huddle's newest YouTube channel, it is, uh, it's called CFB Playbook. And you can find it, I believe, the actual, maybe the, the YouTube URL right now is YouTube.com slash at CFB Playbook. If you try that or if you just see, search uh, CFB Playbook, you should be able to find us there. So please subscribe to that one as well. It's going to be a, a college football uh, channel uh, you know, uh, nationwide, basically. It's going to cover the entire realm of college football, you know, X's and O's and you know, all, all sorts of different stuff. We've got a bunch of plans there for that as well. So please check that out. Subscribe there. And also, of course, subscribe to this channel here. YouTube.com slash Buckeye Huddle. So thank you all for joining us, and we will talk to you guys later.